The Knowledgeable Provider podcast is intended primarily to entertain, also to inform, but it is not a substitute for actual medical training and should not be used by anyone to diagnose or treat any medical condition in themselves or others. If you need medical advice, please make an appointment to see your own knowledgeable medical provider. The opinions expressed by me and anyone else who happens to appear on the podcast are solely those of the people expressing them and are not necessarily representative of any other entities. Other than the lunches at the office, I do not receive any sort of compensation from pharmaceutical or medical device companies, and I have no other relevant financial disclosures. Look, this is all for fun, okay? Don't sue me. All right, on with the show. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to Knowledgeable Provider. This will be the first episode of the new year, 2024, as well as the first episode of season two, along with a couple other firsts going on that I'll mention during the interview. Today, I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Brian James to the podcast. We had a really nice discussion about the art of medicine, which to me means how we practice medicine in the real world, not in a vacuum or in school slash textbook land, where sometimes everything seems very black and white, straightforward, simple, but in actual practice, it really never is. And I think one of the biggest challenges that faces anybody working in clinical medicine is to reconcile the training and what we think of as ideal circumstances or our ideal way of practicing with the reality we find ourselves working in and dealing with. We cover a lot of ground here. Dr. James has a lot of very practical advice, especially for anyone working in our area of primary care, family medicine, or anyone who is considering what their future career in medicine is going to look like. I bet you'll be surprised at some of the things he has to say. So here you go. Enjoy. Dr. Brian James, welcome to Knowledgeable Provider. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate you doing this. Oh, anytime, Jody. Anything for you. You are the first physician I've had on the podcast. Also, the first time using all my cool mobile uh, equipment that I bought. This is very impressive. I, like I said, it's very official. I feel intimidated by this, this okay. technology. Okay. okay, good. I want you to feel it. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never intimidated. I'm intimidated by this technology. <laughs> Uh, also, this is, would be the first time I have any sort of financial disclosure to make on the show since you are the person who signs my paycheck. So I will not be challenging you or provoking you in any way. You're fine. You can challenge away. You know that. <laughs> Seriously, I do appreciate your time. You want to introduce yourself and give your CV and all that? CV is very straightforward, but I'm, I'm Brian James from the Shoals area, went to UAB Medical School, settled after Huntsville Hospital residency into Decatur, Alabama, and I've been in private practice. Straight out of, of residency, I took over a practice of a retiring physician, and I've been here for 12 and a half, nearly 13 years now. And then after uh, I had two little girls, after they got old enough to be involved in things and I needed to have a little extra time, Jody fell into my lap. So he's been with me as my nurse practitioner for a handful of years now. How'd you decide on family practice as opposed to whatever else you might have done? It's the typical story. As a medical student, I went in with an open mind, had no idea what I wanted to do or what I thought I might like changed quickly because every rotation I loved, um, well, like every rotation I loved except for a couple. But um, by the end, it, it boiled down to I wanted to do a little bit of everything. I wanted to be in a small town. I wanted to be kind of a traditional old school small town doc is what I kept coming back to. I wanted to see some kids. I wanted to see the elderly. And family medicine fit the bill. Gotcha. You want to do it all? To do it all. We're here today to talk about the art of medicine. I really like the way that you practice and the way that you've kind of integrated medical training and knowledge and all that into like caring for people in the real world. So I'm very curious to get your perspective on all that. So what, is, what does that mean to you, just the art of medicine? Like, what does the phrase mean to you? It is street smarts versus book smarts. That's it in a nutshell. It's one thing to learn everything. It's another thing to be able to get it done in the real world because certain times and certain people require different situations. Um, you know, what, how, what if you if you want to write a medicine for someone, how do you get it covered? If you want somebody to take a medicine for their well-being and they don't want to, how do you maneuver that situation? If you want to 
maybe treat one way, but the patient has has another way in mind, or if there's supplements involved, how do you deal with all this? Maybe getting people to do things in their best interest, the art of medicine, would be getting people doing things in their best interest sometimes when they, they don't want to go that route. As a physician, how often do you have patients tell you, no, I'm not going to do that? Uh, not often. It's it, Demographically, you can guess who it would be. It's going to be the young males, typically. <laughs> <laughs> Women are very agreeable. Generally, they're, they're easy to, to reason with. Uh, it seems kind of odd that they would be more, I think, more uh, fact-based. Maybe it's just they're more trusting. But uh, you get an adult uh, woman in the office, and it seems like things get done. Uh, you get a young guy in the office, and he's been on too many podcasts like yours where he thinks he knows more than <laughs> that, uh, than you do, and he has ulterior uh, ways of going about it, about his health care that maybe you disagree with or does it, things that don't have, have evidence. Do you feel like that has increased over time? Big time. Big time. Yep. YouTube and podcasts and Google. Yeah, that makes sense. Probably the flip side. I just did a, a podcast with my nephew about type 1 diabetes, and he, was, he more or less diagnosed himself. Well, people are more knowledgeable than ever. Yeah. Yes, but more knowledgeable. But again, a vested interest, which the great part about what you and I do here is we're, we're our own boss. We have, we have no vested interest in anything. I'm coming from a place of uh, clean board, clean slate. And I think our patients realize that in the podcast world, in the YouTube world, in the Google world, it's a little different. People aren't going to do things unless they're getting paid generally. So the question is always who and why and when and how. How well prepared were you? In your training, like when you got here, how, how well prepared did you feel for managing people in the real world versus how things are in the textbook? Very. I mean, it, the situation I had was unique in that Huntsville Hospital just boomed about the time I was there. It was an unopposed residency, family residency in a massive hospital. So we, got to, we, we were first assist from day one on surgeries. We were delivering babies. I had four C-sections the first night I was on call. So I felt completely comfortable. My intern year, I probably saw more craziness than uh, than I uh, that I've seen in twelve and a half years here, in terms of just a controlled environment here versus the chaos there. You once you thrown into the fire, you feel pretty comfortable. You saw a little bit of that at Huntsville Hospital with Hemsy and all that. Oh, for sure, for sure. I feel like there's a, obviously a big difference in nurse practitioner training and physician training, and that I think we I think our first few years on the job are really like our residency. I would agree with that. From what I've seen, for sure. But that's, I'm glad to know that you felt prepared right out of school. Well, I felt very prepared. Well, and I did a lot of moonlighting, um, which I don't know uh, within residencies if that's common now. But my second and third year, I did a lot of urgent care moonlighting, um, which is a different situation in urgent care than in a, than a laid back family practice like this. But again, urgent care, you see the worst in, in a lot of situations. So I felt comfortable with that, too. Cut my teeth that way in terms of having autonomy. How do you feel like your practice has changed over time? I know just, you know, looking back in the computer to the notes from 2011, I can tell at least the way you document has changed a lot. Oh, yeah. How do you feel like you have evolved and changed like that over time? Uh, the practice, it's, it's just age. 12 years is 12 years. All of a sudden, the 38-year-olds are 50 and they're menopausal and hormonal. All right. of a sudden, the you know, 62-year-olds are 76 and they've had a stroke or they had more COVID complications or something like that. So the patient's it's pretty much that because um, I've had I haven't added a lot of new patients aside from family members and friends and kids of current patients. So I would say the the patients have gotten a little bit more complex, but I have a better understanding of them after after getting to know someone for twelve years. You kind of know you know what you're what you're dealing with, and you know their family history, and you see their brothers and their sisters, and you see their cousins. So um, I think it's actually gotten easier for me, even though maybe the patients have gotten older and more complex. Yeah, there's a big difference in taking care of somebody that you've seen for years versus just walking in the room and not knowing anybody for sure. For sure. You can you can kind of come in the room. You're already at third base, you know, in terms of where you're wanting to get with a with an office visit. You don't have to go through a lot of historical things. You already know it. Once you see someone 15 times, you, you learn their, their history. Can you talk about some specific examples of things that maybe we do here that are not the textbook way or or kind of going back to that art of medicine thing, like things that we do just based on realistic expectations versus maybe what, what the textbook would say is the right thing to do? I mean, probably the biggest thing in here would be our acute visits. Textbooks would say when someone is sick, you know, uh, let's say it's a, if it's a viral process, you kind of pat them on the butt. This too shall pass. They'll get better. Uh, but people in the real world, people have expectations. They don't come to the doctor and spend a copay or possibly have to pay a deductible, all that to be told, oh, it's a virus, you'll get better. They, they won't help. They want to get back to work. 
you know, they want they want the congestion gone. They want the headache gone. So that's probably, which that may be a third of our visits maybe would be acute care visits. So that's probably going to be the biggest thing. Now, we're pretty much by the book in terms of chronic care, whether it's uh, diabetic management, it's uh, A, then B, then C. We don't really deviate from what the, I guess, what the guidelines would tell you on that in terms of how to, how to manage hypertension, uh, diabetes, cholesterol, et cetera. The, the day-to-day stuff is where the art of medicine would come in. Maybe we do with, with certain people. Maybe you're a little bit more liberal in terms of uh, doing phone work. If it's a, a little widower that lives out you know, 40 minutes away, you're more apt to try to treat things over the phone with her so she doesn't have to get out and drive. Um, but that's where it comes back to knowing your patients, too. Once you see someone for a while, you get a, get a read on that. A kid's off at college, you know, and you're, you've seen him for two or three years. How do you deal with that? Do you, do you try to call something in to help him out just based on history, or do you tell him to go to an urgent care to be seen? You know, just a uh, case-by-case basis. But it, we, do, we do do things differently based on the patient, based on their history, based on our comfort level with them, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's one thing that, that Anne-Marie and I, the other nurse practitioner, talk about a lot is everything's just sort of a gray area. Like the, the right answer for one person is not the right answer for someone else. That's right. And I think patients appreciate that. I think so. You've got to have rules, but, um, but they're, they're, you know, if you just saw someone, I, I don't know, well, maybe they're, they're six month lab check for cholesterol and thyroid, and then seven days later they get in poison oak. I mean, is that really, is it really necessary to bring them back in? When you just saw them, or can we take a little history over the phone, maybe even digitally, you know, you see a picture now. Things are easy. And then say, if it's not better, come back in. We try to be flexible. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. I think people appreciate that a lot. I hope so. I hope so, too. Yeah. But there, there, are, there are limitations. People get mad. You know, I just saw you. Why, do you. why can't you call in something? And we have to look back and say, well, it was seven weeks ago. Things change in seven weeks versus three days. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is also a business. That's true. You being somebody who not only is a physician, but owns the practice, runs the practice, how often do considerations like that play into? Uh, Practically none. We're settled. We're fine. You know, we're okay. We have we have uh, adequate volume. We have uh, fierce loyalty from 99 percent of our patients. So I'm not really worried about anything like that. I make it a point to really not look at it at the bottom line until the end of the year when I have to turn things into an accountant. So I'm not really worried about that because it takes care of itself. If you treat people well, they keep coming and your business will be fine. But now that said. It, obviously, if it got to the point where I'm doing a lot of unpaid work, you know, I, I imagine that would just start to stick in my craw a little bit. It's just never gotten to that point where it has to be a consideration. A lot of doctors' offices have different ways of, of managing, like no shows. That's a huge thing. With not for us, again, we have we have patients that we've established with us. They generally call. We may get a no show a day amongst the three of us. How do you navigate that if you get four or five no shows a day? And uh, you know, a lot of offices now are charging no-show uh, fees and you know, penalties for that. And then if you're a patient and you have options, would you just turn around and go to a different practice? There's lots of those considerations too, just being flexible with patients and then they'll return the favor later. I have noticed here that we don't charge for a lot of things that we probably could get away with. Ooh, with. paperwork. Yeah, any other, any other profession, professional would probably charge for a lot of things we do. We do paperwork left and right that could be, could be billed for, I'm sure. Which now that I've been here, well, I think probably the point of that is to limit the amount more than it is to get the money, you know. Very well could be, yeah. To make people think twice about picking up the phone and calling. Because, man, being up in our front office, it's amazing what they, it's amazing the volume of stuff that they have to deal with. They put up with a lot. And staffing, uh, ta- going back to the reason our practice is, has been so steady, we have complete stability with our staff. And our staff is really good. They have their days, but everybody has their days. But um, overall, I couldn't ask for better staff. Yeah, we are lucky. We are lucky to have them. Absolutely. Can you think of any specific examples of things that we do like off-label or things that, to me, that's very much a part of the art of medicine is using things off-label and kind of thinking outside the box about how to prescribe and different options that you have. Can you think of any specific examples of of things like that? Tons. uh, Even, well... Uh, using medications for their side effects. In some, in some instances, uh, it happens. If a medication may be clean, may be cheaper, uh, may be safer in general than maybe a newer medication for, for X, Y, or Z problem, but maybe that medication's not been uh, approved for the intention that you're, you're giving it. The, the kicker is there, if there are no money in, in, the, in the medicine, who the heck's going to go back and get approval for certain indications? You know, for maybe an old cheap medicine that works great, has been tried and true, um, but we use we use medications for 
for their not FDA approved reasons quite a bit. Uh, another, uh, probably the best, I guess, examples would be if you're, let's say you're starting a patient on blood pressure medicine. And if it's a, if they're a clean slate patient, if they have no medical history, then, then there is kind of an algorithm for that. It's if, if you're this race or you're for this age, you maybe you want to try this medication. But uh, let's say a patient has a history of migraines, or uh, let's say they have, let's say it's a, it's a female patient, 42 years old, that has a history of slightly higher heart rate but normal. Let's say their resting heart rate's 90. They have a history of panic attacks or social anxiety, and they have migraine history. Well, beta blockers aren't first line hardly at all at this point, but for them, that may be right up their alley. So you can use, even though that's not the intention, the intention is to start a blood pressure medicine. If it has, uh, if it has secondary benefits for that patient, then why not? If you have a patient, uh, maybe a second line diabetic medicine, there are all kinds of options second line. Generally, the insurances want you to try the cheap ones, but uh, the cheap ones oftentimes cause weight gain, cause hypoglycemic episodes. Well, maybe you want to skip ahead and try a medication if this patient's maybe a little heavier that helps with weight loss. You know, that's the unintended consequences, but the intention of the weight loss would be to help the blood sugar in a roundabout way. You're going to fix their problem via a side effect, but, um, which those will be the effects eventually when these types of medica- medications are all approved for weight loss. But, but there's lots of examples like that. Remember the guy you told me about that uh, would come in and ask for a sex pill? That was a yeah. holdover from the previous physician. Yeah, yeah so he, he was on an antidepressant uh, to, for the side effect of anorgasmia, um, which worked. And he had no idea why he was taking it. He didn't know, you know, he knew it was, uh, he did not know it was an antidepressant. But the previous doctor had given it to him for years and just to slow him down and it worked. Worked like a charm. Cheap and safe. That's very art of medicine right yeah. there. That is very neat. Probably got some mood benefit from it, too. That's right. Happier mood, too. Don't we have somebody that takes potassium because their wrist hurts or something? We have a, yeah, we have a Wellbutrin for sinuses. Yeah. And um, we have a potassium for joint aches, go figure. As long as the potassium's okay, uh, you know, we check his potassium. It works out. I think there's two. It's a, fe- a female and a male. But uh, uh, the Wellbutrin for sinuses, uh, that is a... Uh, very smart man um, that he's done his own research and he found some obscure study, if I remember, and said that it maybe has benefit because he tried everything, gone to ENT, he's gone to allergies, and he swears it works. So, okay. Hey, whatever. That's right. No side effects, no complaints. I'm, I'm fine with it if it helps him. And he lives in North Alabama, the allergy capital of the world. Yeah, it's almost weird if somebody doesn't have allergies That's right. here. That's right. How often do you go along with that sort of thing when people bring in stuff that they found? Like, are you, are you generally more likely to say, sure, go for it? Or, Well, as long as it doesn't interact with anything, if I don't see a, a harm to it, then I, I may play along. But normally it would be a, a short leash. It would be, OK, we can try this, but we need to check that afterwards or you need to really call us back if it's not working after X time, you know, two weeks, four weeks, whatever. Sure. And and obviously don't uh, don't paint it as this is kooky, but um just make make sure they realize this is a little bit off the beaten path, which is okay. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, two p- patients, uh, they have to have a vested in- interest in their own health. And and we a lot of a lot of times, especially, I mean, we have a lot of engineers, all that. They they're probably smarter than us. So the thought would be, well, I mean, you you can take an active role in it. I can just be your sounding board, and um, you know, I can help you with certain things. I can you can manage the rest yourself. Uh, blood pressure. We have guys that graph it out. Blood sugars graph it out. They change their diet as they see fit. They can manage things. We can just help them. Yeah, you know, we can uh, be their partner with their healthcare instead of dictate. Yeah, I love that approach. Uh, and you, and you're right. To me, with the with the patients who are obviously smarter than me and are obviously like very <laughs> on top of everything, I'm just like, hey, working for you. It's working for me. Have a great day. And they appreciate that too. Who else would have a, a more vested interest in their personal health than them? Absolutely. A, a big thing to me about art of medicine is utilization of resources. Like, how do you think about that as far as ordering testing or ordering imaging, you know, all, all that kind of stuff, being conservative versus pulling the trigger on yeah. things? Yeah, super conservative in terms of that. I try my best. Every annual checkup, uh, and you and I try, you know, 40 to 50 year olds, at least try to get them into the habit of coming in once a year and just doing a broad screen that's really the only time that we do a kind of a shotgun approach where we just screen with various labs. But at that visit, you know, maybe we want to do a, an EKG. I always ask, you know, have you had, have you seen a cardiologist? Have you had an EKG in the last three to six months? And I try just to cancel it. If, you know, I, there's no reason for us to duplicate services. Being a kind of a good steward of the healthcare dollar from what I see in here, it's not, it's not really, 
uh, kind of the one-off test, it, it would be duplication of services. And that goes back to what you said when you know your patient. If I, if I was working in the ER and if someone came in with a, with a raging headache, I would be far more apt not knowing them to order a CT scan, followed up by an MRI or whatever we had to do. If, uh, if it's one of our patients, I know their history. So I would be more, more conservative in that case. I would feel more comfortable with the patient. They would feel more comfortable with me, too, that if we can try to manage it a little bit cheaper slash more conservatively, try, try this medicine, try this remedy. If it doesn't work, then we'll jump to bigger tests. That was kind of a thing for me. It took me a while to get comfortable. Like, Well, coming from training, there's no, I mean, it's an open checkbook. If you have, and you too, you see the worst pathology at the big academic center. So you see a headache. I mean, we had a, a Guatemalan, I think Guatemalan immigrant that had a, you know, a tapeworm in his brain. So he comes in with a, with a seizure and a headache and you're, you see that one time and then every, and you're young, a little bit green. And then you think everybody with a headache uh, could have a tapeworm in their brain. When in reality, no, not, not very often around, around these parts, but uh, you don't want to miss the, like what you and I talk about, we say the horses and the zebras analogy, but you don't want to miss a zebra, but the zebras don't come around very often. So the horses are typically what you see. Yeah. I, I struggled with that for a while as far as when to feel comfortable ordering something that I know is more expensive or whatever, which I, I feel comfortable enough now that not only I'm comfortable, like if I feel like it needs to be ordered, I'm going to order it. Order it. Yes. Wow. But I also feel more comfortable. And this is a big thing for me, actually, just telling people like, it's probably this and you're probably fine. Yeah. And with experience, you, you can look at a patient, especially someone you know, and you, you can kind of see if they're sick. You can look at them and tell if they're ill or if they're if, if this maybe is not that that big of a deal just based on how they look. History wise, you'll get 90 plus percent of it from history, though, if you ask the right, right questions. That's an interesting topic. So I the practice that I took over or the patients that I took over. The physician that saw them was very like, you come in here, you get naked. I look between your toes. Yes. You know, you're here from you're here for two hours. Yes. How do you balance the expectation of putting your hands on somebody versus I think what everybody in medicine kind of knows, which is the what you tell me is the most important okay. thing. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because, pa- again, patients will tell you way more than you can find with your fingertips. And from my experience, yeah, when I got here, that's a that's a feel and a comfort level type thing. When I got here, we did you know, kind of bare bones, annual checkups. I, I poked and prodded and took my time and maybe out of 40 minutes, you know, 25 of my minutes was spent standing up, poking, you know, pulling, twisting, looking. And now I just, I've found that the review of systems just asking detailed questions just from head to toe, pretty much with every patient. Uh, you're having headaches. Is your vision okay? Are you swallowing okay? Um, any indigestion, bowel changes, bladder changes, et cetera. I go through the same, try to go through the same questionnaire with every one of them. I get way more information out of that for sure. So I've, I've morphed big time into, into hands-on only based on what they tell me um, and occasionally poking and prodding. But when I got here, I felt uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, incom- uncomfortable with my diagnostic skills. So I would do it constantly. You know, it didn't matter if you didn't have abdominal pain. I'm poking on your belly. That's just what I did. OK. You know, which is how you're trained to. You want to you want to cast a wide net. But uh, in, in an effort to be a little bit more efficient, too, where patients, they come in with a lot of times a lot of questions they want to ask that you may not be able to get to if you're assessing their bicep strength <laughs> on, a, on a 48 year old that has no complaints whatsoever and wouldn't care if his bi- if his left bicep was slightly, slightly less strong than his right bicep you know yeah that's a great point and time management is a huge part to me of art of medicine too how do you feel about that yeah uh, it's uh, you, you get better with time and, and the time management becomes less of an issue once you know the patient because again you can cut to the chase with them so you have plenty of time to just hear them out go through any problems they have Rarely now do I have to cut someone off or, or just say I have to, you know, I cannot get get further behind. You know, maybe you have to come back next week or sometimes in the in the patient room, I'll look at my schedule and say next Tuesday at 2 p.m. I have a 20 minute opening. We especially if it's a retiree that works off and I say, come back then we'll go through the rest of your problems. But, yeah, time management is is key. But uh, you get a, You get a feel for that. That's just a experience thing. I think I can tell that I'm getting better at that. For sure you are. For sure you are. When I when I got here, I thought I had to talk about every problem with every patient, regardless of how long it took. And now, now I'm more like, I'm, I'm not like watching the clock, but I kind of have developed a feel of like, okay, it's been too long now. You, you do have a feeling. You have the internal clock. And you'll, you'll have, I guess, with time, you when once you know the patient, it's more of a problem-oriented approach with everything. Like, I know the things that are not a problem with this patient, so there's no need of, of wasting any time going through those. Let's go through the problems especially for the shorter follow-up visits, I kind of look at it now as, you know, if you don't have anything, I'll 
hit the high points with you. But if there's something you want to talk about, great. But that's what we're using the time for. And we're not going to talk about these other things. That, that has helped me a lot, I think. Yep. Agreed. Yep. And the, yeah, it just that you're not, you're not Superman. There's not, there's not an indefinite amount of time, et cetera. You know, you've got to, you've got to uh, prioritize, but that goes with anything. You know, no, no one can just sit around. Well, in our line of work, no one in healthcare can just sit around and shoot the breeze the whole time. You can do it. You can have a nice mix. So your patients feel comfortable. Sure. Yeah. I think that's very important. That rolls into how do you feel about sharing personal information or, or how often do you have more of a personal relationship or, or share things about your own life? We're an open book in here. Again, it goes back to just a, a small town family practice. You can't get away from that here. If you were in an urban area where you just don't, see, you know, when you go to Lowe's, you don't see anybody you know. That's one thing. But here, if you go to Publix or Lowe's or Walmart or Target, you're going to see several of your patients. And uh, the patients want to know about you. They want to know you're, you're a human. You're not a robot like everybody else. But yeah, I have no problems. I had today um, before you got here. I, I brought two canvases that I that I had bought from Hobby Lobby. Me and my youngest were walking through, and we saw them on sale. So I bought canvases, acrylic paint, and I had them paint uh, just huge pictures for my room. So in my office rooms, which the the patients, especially my ladies, love seeing that. But I have my kids' pictures everywhere. I have huge gaudy paintings from my from my daughters in there, and it makes it feel comfortable. But they they like seeing that too. Uh, family pictures in the in my, of my family pictures in in my exam rooms. You know, I have social media. I, I post once a year, if that. And it's normally <laughs> about a kid's sporting event. But but um, you know, they I, I don't have a problem if a patient looks me up. No problem at all. I still don't know how I feel about like friend requests from patients and all that yet. Well, it's, it's comfort level. You you've got to figure that out for yourself. I haven't developed a, a good strategy for that yet. As long as you're not dealing with well, the our malpractice provider would. Very, very, very much like us, I'm sure, to, to a, well, I'm not, I'm sure, I know, to completely avoid all medical talk on uh, social media, which, you know, I generally do, unless it's an, a surface level question. But uh, other than that, I mean, you're still a human. Sure. Yeah. It's whatever you feel comfortable with. Sure. Is our malpractice, do our malpractice people need to weigh in on this podcast? <laughs> no, no, we're not doing anything, uh, anything too, too strange or too, uh, too questionable online, for sure. The first segment of the podcast is a huge disclaimer. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Huge disclaimer. Talk about work-life balance. I've, I've always kind of admired that you want to get out of here and spend as much time with your girls as you can. How do you? How was your thinking about that changed over the years? Yeah, well, I didn't have any until uh, until the hospitalist program here locally at the hospital kicked in, and I and I felt comfortable enough to back down on inpatient because you know doctors years ago, especially primary care doctors, forget about it. You were when you're on call, you're you're gone. Uh, you're in the hospital all, all hours. But once I backed down off of that and just did social visits to the hospital and then I, it, it freed me up a lot for, to just manage my, my patients in the office, which then bringing you on and uh, getting, getting two, uh, two physician extenders to manage kind of some of the, it, well, the way I've described it to my patients when, whenever, rarely now, because they know you guys very well, whenever I get any kickback, it's uh, my my explanation is, you know, maybe an hour and a half to two hours of my day clinically was managing a sprained ankle, poison oak, an ear infection, a, st- uh, a strep throat, and a rash. There's no reason after after doing this for as long as I have that I that I should be spending, you know, two hours of my day doing that, which would take away two hours from my daughters later in the afternoon when I could hire someone that is perfectly capable of doing that and that I could follow right along with. So uh, that has made a world of difference bringing in you, especially, and then Anne-Marie later, uh, right around the time COVID hit, to be kind of our, our uh, urgent care in, in here. But um, my stance with really anything is after hours, forget about it. I'm accessible via the on-call phone and all that, but I'm with, I'm with my girls. And I don't do any, you know, any uh, meetings after hours. I do one meeting a month at lunch, and that's at the hospital for a committee, and it's just a low-key committee. Once I get to the point where the girls are out of, of high school and uh, and their their activities aren't around, I'm sure I'll be a lot more involved and do a lot more things. You know, whether it's hospital committees or whatever else, but I'm not doing any of that right now. It's all about about family. I love that, and I'm sure that's part of having a lot of flexibility as far as being independent, owning your own practice. Well, and another thing too, we're we're very lucky because you and I can remote into our charts. Um, you know, 15 years ago that didn't exist. You had to finish before you went home or you're perpetually behind. Now I can finish up with the bulk of everything. And if I have an hour of work to do, I can do it from 10 to 11 p.m. after my daughters go to sleep. 
and just remote in. So that technology has really made it made it more flexible for us. It can be a double edged sword, I guess, because for you, for you, for you, not for me. Well, no, I'm saying because we've talked about like you know in the old days they just scribble a couple notes oh, down true, on a piece of paper true, and true. go. Oh, yeah, true, true, paper. true. I thought you were going to get at your distractions. You're constantly no. <laughs> you, you're trying to do your notes, and you think of a YouTube video you want to watch or a song. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. They, we, you and I write narratives for everything, which I do like that. And I think that all of the other people that read our notes, whether it's other doctors' offices, they really appreciate that. But we're verbose for sure in how we write things. I hope people that we refer to and all that appreciate that. Because I, I know if I know I'm going to refer a patient somewhere, I try to write the note yes. with that in mind of like, let me put the pertinent stuff at the top. And, you know, with the hope that the specialist is going to read it before they see the patient. I assume they read our notes. I don't know. Yeah, they do. They they do. They still would, would get their their history majority wise from the patient. But they will, at least the ones I, w- I was with in training, they would like any information they could get prior. I would think so. Yeah, I would imagine so. Is there anything that you do now that you know, looking back to Chief Resident Brian James, is there anything that you do now that you think Chief Resident James would be uh, would be surprised about or had not expected? No, not really. That's a boring answer. I don't think I'm the same person, <laughs> same moral compass, same thought processes. I'm, I mean, uh, same wife. I don't, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't see anything different. OK. Yeah. What, the way it's going is the way I intended it for the most part. So, yeah, yeah. I don't see anything different. That's remarkable. I'm glad I, I, hear that. I know. I know. I know. I'm a measure twice cut once once type of guy for sure. I, you're very stable, like emotionally, mentally, or you seem that way. How do you like, how do you do that? No, I think I'm wired that way. I think some people are wired different ways. Things just don't get me, don't get me too worked up. I don't think I've ever seen you upset about anything. No, I've that, but that's my nature. I just, uh, just kind of hit the jackpot on that. I think people have different temperaments. A lot of it could be how you're brought. Well, of course, it's nature versus nurture. Um, what percentage? Who knows? But I, that's just my nature. I'm lucky with that, that I don't get worked up. It bothers people around me that I don't get worked up. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, but it helps me and helps me in business. It helps me in uh, the, the practice for sure to have, an, to have an even keel. I'd like to say that I have an even keel all the time, but I don't. You definitely have an even keel. I don't know, man. No, no, no. C- compared to average, you are you are at the at the tippy top. Okay, I'll take that for sure. for sure. That's a diagnosis. You're a doctor, so that's a diagnosis. Yeah, you only scream into pillows. You don't scream out <laughs> loud into people towards people. <laughs> All right, that is true. Yep. What advice would you give people who are currently in medical training or residence? What advice do you have for people coming up? It's complicated now. I've been out for so so long. I don't really know how it. You know what they're seeing, what they're hearing coming through. I know when I came through, there was uh, it was right when Obamacare was hitting, and the the really the business of medicine was taking over. Where most of the residents coming out were, they just thought I'm going to be an employee. The thought of uh, building your own practice or owning your own practice or buying out a practice, it was that was the way it just happened decades ago. And then by the time I was coming through, it seemed like it was over fifty percent. I'm just going to be an employee, get a paycheck, and go home. I would encourage, especially in primary care, anybody going into family, pediatrics, uh, internal medicine to uh, have an open mind about things because you can always be an employee, but have an open mind about things in regards to the business side of things because of all the perks you and I get from this autonomy, flexibility, uh, again, having some an ownership stake in what you're doing. The business of medicine, the uh, the medical students and residents just don't get any any training in that, or at least when I went through, you didn't get any training in that. I was just lucky to, when I shadowed or had, uh, I had uh, some good rotations, especially with some private practice doctors around uh, Madison County and then out in Scottsboro, where I got to see the business side of things and ask the right questions to feel more comfortable doing it this way. Otherwise, in terms of like just the, the big, you know, kind of advice, uh, just like I did, don't go into it with a set idea of what you want to do, because it may change because uh, medicine is a wide range. Even in family medicine, I, you know, we could do whatever we wanted. We could do nursing homes. We could do uh, hospice care. We could do uh, aesthetics. We could do weight loss. We could do uh, traditional. We could do direct pay. We could do concierge. Um, you better do something you enjoy or you're going to be miserable. But then again, you got to realize it's a job and don't expect to uh, to have just some rosy uh, uh, rosy lifestyle uh, with great hours. If you want to go into neurosurgery, you got to be realistic about this. If you go into pediatrics, don't expect uh, don't expect to not get sick. 
But uh, just have an open mind. The same stuff they read from every self-help book and every <laughs> every uh, how to get into medical school and what to expect in medical school book. I don't do really disagree with much of that. Yeah, and it's it's hard to fail in medicine. You're going to be fine financially no matter what you go into. So do something you you generally like. Don't don't chase. Going back to the whole running the practice and and balancing things. How much do the insurance companies and the payers figure into how how you do things and how you think about things or operate? Not really at all. I mean, because they all pay the, you know, it's pretty much the same an office visit as an office visit. So not really at all. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know really if I've done any insurance like credentialing changes probably last eight years, something like that. I mean, we just uh, just keep our credentials up with Medicare and uh, well, I, well, let's take that back. So one thing that that was an issue was was Medicaid. We couldn't make ends meet practically if we're taking Medicaid patients. So that it that does financially, I will I'll take that back. A Medicaid population is tough to to manage financially, and especially with the uh, Medicaid kids. When I decided I didn't want to see young kids because I didn't want to keep up with inventory of vaccinations and all this, this was early in my practice. Then we pretty much stopped stopped taking Medicaid because it was that would be a a bulk of it would be you know young kids with that. But outside of that, like all the regular I guess quote unquote payers, but. Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and Aetna, and Cigna, and Humana, and United. I don't see any major difference with any of them. You know, in Medicare, no, no difference. We do the same with all of them. Same type of charges, same billing. You have to, illegally. Right, sure. I don't know, and I don't deal with the billing side of things. I have one of my staffers that trained in that, and she does our billing, so I have no idea who's who's more difficult to deal with. I intentionally don't know that. Yeah, p- patients ask me questions sometimes about money, and I'm like, you have to talk to them up there. That's right. Maybe this is not a good question, but from like the patient side of things, what what advice do you have for patients coming in to communicate with their medical providers? How do you feel like it's most effective for patients to try to communicate for us? Uh, get your ducks in a row for sure before you come in, uh, because it seems like, which I think this is human nature, but when you and I, go, which after doing this for years, again, you go through a lot of information, a lot of data points, a lot of, of do's and don'ts and recommendations and say a 20 minute office visit, I cannot imagine as a patient remembering all of that. I can't imagine once, once, if, once I start asking my questions that a patient could stay on track with what they intended to ask. So even though sometimes it can be a handful for us, they may want to write things down and uh, jot things down is fine. I do not like the idea of being recorded in a room because uh, like I've told you before, I would make the news every day if if what I said <laughs> was recorded. <laughs> but I'm uh, very politically correct. But uh, but in terms of jotting things down, um, making lists, making notes. I mean, unless it's over the top for us, and or maybe a little bit too much, or in terms of time time needed to go through everything, I think that's a good idea. Keeping medication list is always helpful. Any patients that have more than one provider, they see um, super helpful for them because you. You know how how many how much time we take kind of chasing down uh, labs, chasing down external uh, office notes and all that. Medications can be adjusted or changed. Supplements we need to know. Just keep a little keep a little list. Uh, just be detailed in your own uh, documentation. I do appreciate the people who come in with their blood pressure readings and blood sugar readings and all that. You know, mapped out it makes life easy for us. And you know, like I'll take I'll take their word for it if they say, "Oh, it's always 120 over 80 at home," but I I don't necessarily believe that. But if they have a if they have a list, you know, they have it documented, I'm more likely to believe that. And the the I would say the vast majority of, I guess, back and forth with patients is over either their blood pressures or their blood sugars as to it not matching what we get here. I think that's the biggest, because in, in, I will say both of those issues, they can manage on their own at home in terms of the monitoring. They should be able to. So as long as they have a good calibrated cuff, which that we always offer, bring it in here and calibrate next to ours and next to our, with our nurse's ears. But anyways, as long as they check it at home religiously, then I'll, I will trust what they get at home. White coat hypertension is legit. Oh, absolutely. For sure. Yeah. I always, I cringe when I see the list come out, but yeah, it is a bad, it's a good way to keep up with things. <laughs> uh, yeah. What I've done, which I told you this through the years too, I always say, you know, pick your two or three biggest things on that biggest issues and we'll go through that. We just don't have time to go through 18. I haven't explicitly limited somebody like that before. I'm, I'm not there yet. I do. Well, I, I do with, with you know, the, the long timers I have in here for sure. But you can get away with saying stuff to people that no other human on the planet can. <laughs> Sometimes, yes. And they appreciate it. I, apparently, they keep coming back. Yep, that's right. That's right. You know, when I when I was kind of shadowing you, I was, it was, I was constantly amazed at the things you could do. <laughs> 
with <laughs> people <laughs> like candor and they like they, they like the bluntness i think it's not insult i'm not insulting which i don't care if they insult no, me not, right. no of course not right 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 yeah i don't yeah, i have thick skin but yeah when someone tells me they they haven't eaten in 10 days but they've gained five pounds you know i'm gonna call them out on that that's just part of it or that diets don't work for them i'm gonna call them out on that i don't know if you want me revealing your what you say to people, but God, I just love seeing you bust in the room going, you're not going to overwhelm me with a bunch yeah, of stuff that's, today. Or, that's Your crazy true. tale is not going to bombard me with a bunch of stuff today. Or. That's true. That's true. I do. And again, they like it because I, I talk to them like I'm seeing them at Lowe's. Like I said, they have people like that. Well, that's all, that's the only way I know to be. Yeah, that's a that's a huge part of, of this is figuring out what how your personality is going to be with the yeah. patients, I guess. Yeah, which... The, the listeners don't know our, our situation here, but no white coats, no ties. Again, they, they for all I know, I, that I could be um, the catch me if you can, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio and be uh, faking every bit of this because all of our diplomas are in the back offices. Like there's not things up. Um, it's just a different vibe in here for sure. I think so. The, uh, the dentist's office I go to reminds me of here because they're sort of they're very laid back and just cool about everything. I appreciate yeah. that. I know I, that it's, it goes back to if you were a patient, what would you want? I wouldn't want it to be stiff. And uh, I, I, th- I just think things, times have changed in terms of that. But into that's our, uh, my nature. Your nature is, is too to be more laid back uh, as you're in blue jeans and I'm in, uh, I'm in sweatpants. <laughs> Definitely. Just, the, the office is closed today. This is not a working day. Around. That's right. He doesn't wear blue jeans to work, but, <laughs> but I wouldn't mind one bit, you know, wearing scrubs to work, which I don't, but I would. I just I just don't want to go and buy a bunch of scrub, <laughs> but I could I would. Oh yeah, I, I feel really weird in a white coat, but it, which I have a whole thing about practitioners wearing white coats anyway. But I do feel odd putting it on, like it's behind the door, but it's probably got a hole in it from hanging on the. <laughs> That's hook. exactly right. Mine mine has not been pulled off aside from a picture when I got here, and pay, I think patients like that. You know, so it, again, a lot of it is I don't when I leave here, I don't want people to know I'm a doctor. When you would never know I'm a doctor, I don't think um, the way I act and dress. But um, or you're in a white coat, people see you and they they kind of have expectations or want to ask you things, want to want to corner you. If I walk around in regular clothes, I mean, I could be working at the bank for all they know. How do you handle people who are not patients asking you medical questions? I mean, not your patient. I mean, I just answer answer super you know superficial. You don't want to uh, back yourself into a corner where you give try to give detailed answers for someone that you don't really know that well. But um, I don't you know, I don't mind talking medicine. You know, as long as you're not violating any privacy rules or whatever else. Sure. Yeah, no problem. If because uh, it is what it is, you're going when people find out that what you do for a living, they're going to ask. I struggle to navigate that a little bit. Not not necessarily with patient people who aren't my patients, but for me, it's been the people who are my friends. A lot of them have become patients, so when yeah. they need a whatever, they're fine just hollering at me and going, "Hey, can you call me in at whatever?" And that I don't. I that makes me uncomfortable. I haven't figured out how to really deal with that. That's tough. I mean, just setting boundaries is tough for everything. Family members and friends and all that, which my, well, my family, I think they understand the boundaries. They, I don't really have much of an, I don't have any issue, actually, aside from just superficial questions um, asked, I think, from my family members. You know, friends will ask me questions and that are not patients. But I mean, they're not asking me to prescribe medications and all that for them unless, I mean, maybe once every blue moon, there's, you know, a, a cortisone cream for poison oak someone has run out and their doctor's closed or something like that i may have had those types of questions but it's nothing devious it's nothing you know nothing with malice or, or that i could get in trouble for where where there's any ethical or moral issues i don't think and any any friends that would put try to put you on the spot like that i would i would second guess the friendship they not saying that that's what you're saying yes that is what i'm saying <laughs> oh okay okay the key is to not have any friends <laughs> Okay. So I, have, I have a vicious wall in front of you. No one can, can penetrate. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not there yet. I'm halfway there, but not yeah. there yet. <laughs> Get off my lawn. <laughs> what else? What have I not asked you about that I should have asked you about? Or what else? Uh, what else would you like to share about your medical practice or your experience in medicine? Staffing we could talk about in terms of art of medicine, but that's a whole different can of worms. Like I said, we're just lucky. We have we've had. Three staffers in particular have been with us for, I mean, we're talking about over a decade or a decade plus at this point. So what else would you say about that? Would you say about staffing? Ooh, it's tough because I've been lucky and haven't had to go into it. It's tough. As the old, the old saying, it's, uh, uh, it's a lot easier to retain someone than to hire someone new or to reach to, to train someone new. So uh, just treat your staff well. It's a little, 
a little bit more complicated in here because I have a staff that are that are mainly our age. So you're talking about 40, uh, high 30s, 40, low 40s, which means they have kids, which means they have things that pop up. So treat them as as if you would want to be treated. So we don't hassle them over dental appointments. We don't hassle them over running to, a, to another doctor's appointment or leaving one hour early to go to a school event. As long as they do a good job and get their work done, we don't hassle them too much over the cell phones. That's that's probably going to be a big a bone of contention for a lot of employers. But as long as they get their work done, as long as they respect the respect our process, then you know we're flexible. We uh, we don't have a time clock anymore in here, which we really never had like a firm time clock. That's definitely something you wouldn't get working at a big healthcare system where you get docked thirty minutes for lunch, and you for know sure. you can't clock in more than three minutes earlier. You know all that stuff. For sure, which and the, but our lunches, you know, we have a, we have a longer lunch, but it's because you and I and Anne Marie have to get done with work. I mean, we would be we would be here until late if we didn't have that at least hour hour fifteen for lunch, just to get caught up on our morning. That is a huge thing. You told me before it's a better day if you can get the morning stuff done before the afternoon. That that is very true. At the morning is more of the scheduled patients. The afternoon will be some scheduled patients, but you never know what you're getting in the afternoon. So get done with the morning as fast as you can at, at lunch. And that's probably a big thing, too, is getting the documentation, the charting done. We, our, our thing here is we finished today, today. One of my little claims to fame in here was I never went to sleep without with work left undone for the prior day. Now I have here or there, I'll fudge, you know, on a Friday only. But um, if on a Friday I have we have ball games or something like that, I may every once in a while I'll wake up Saturday morning and finish my Friday nights. But during the weekdays, it's done. I don't care if it's 12, 15 a.m., you know, eleven fifteen p.m. Uh, uh, if it needs to be done, it's done, and that makes my life so much easier the next day. And the staff's life—they're not chasing things constantly because we're done, we're caught up. I think that's really important. I can see how that could get out of control. Yeah, when well, it's just being a responsible adult. What a drag. <laughs> yep, that's right. That's right. Get it done. Quit procrastinating. I did a rotation at a family practice where there was a whole situation and and essentially it ended up being just me and this physician in the office, nobody else there trying to see patients. And I mean, there's literally stuff piled up on the desks. There's, you know, the fax machine is literally throwing faxes out on the floor. I mean, it was, I, it was unbelievable. I still can't believe it. Errors will be made. That's right. There were like not that many patients there and they waited hours to see us. It just, it was crazy. Yep. That's a, well into that just the efficiency that we get things done and the efficiency that but we, we get our work done. We're not behind the next day. So our patients don't wait here really at all, which that's just good scheduling. But um, you know who is who is prone to be long winded, who's prone to be brief. If you have a just a in general, just generalities here, if you have a 36 year old uh, male coming in compared to a 68 year old female, one of those two is going to take longer. They like to sit and talk versus they want to get out of here, you know, go watch the ball game or go watch, you know, uh, get back on their uh, their YouTube podcast. Um, to uh, to disprove you, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> they have research to do. They got to get out of here. That's right. The thirty eight year old male wants to get out of here, so you don't have to schedule them a forty minute appointment versus the uh, eighty eight year old female. You know, there's an art to scheduling. Yeah, our folks are really good about al- allowing more time for people they know are going to take longer. For sure, and what, but once you know the patients, you can do that. So that which is great. Uh, there's an art to the fasting situation. If we want to do labs in the morning, which with a bulk of our patients we do, we bring them in in the morning. I mean, can you imagine fasting until eleven fifteen? So you know when I when I will roll in at a, a ten forty five patient, and they've been I know they've been fasting. I'm more apt to get with it just to get them back so they can go eat because I'm moody if I don't eat. You know, by that point, I almost feel I, well. I do feel bad for them. Versus the eight o'clock or the eight thirty, I may be a little bit more laid back and take my full time in there with them. I've even noticed that as I've aged, that I have more compassion for the fasting. Or I'll say, if you you don't have any more issues, I will just get you on back, and which is more efficient for for me too to get them on back there. But into the lab, uh, the you've got a bunch of employees in the lab that are separate from us that they don't want to work through their lunch. I guess there are offices that make people come back to get their results. How do you? think about dealing with that as far as just communicating results and, you know, not bringing patients in excessively when you don't really have to. Yeah. I mean, it, when I initially started, a lot of times we did that. And now, and I know a lot of the doctors I train with, they said specifically, you need to bring them back to do that. That's work you're doing and you should be compensated for your work. But again, it gets to the point now where it just, it, it hassles a lot of patients, especially if you, I mean, if you're working, if you're retired, that's one thing you got time to come in to the doctor's office. And it's a social visit for some people. 
But um, uh, again, if you're a 52 year old with a job, you don't want to have to come back in to hear normal results. If you know, if that abnormalities, I, if it's anything significant, I don't see a problem bringing people in. But we've gotten to the point now where we just call with results on almost everything. Uh, even if a scan needs to be set up uh, or further testing needs to be arranged, we just typically we do it over the phone. Which I hope the patients uh, patients appreciate. Yeah, I would appreciate that as a patient. I don't want to be I don't want to be brought back in. It goes back to the golden rule. If you were a patient, what would you want? How would you want to be treated? Sure. We don't have the portal, but I, we just have the office folks call with lab results. And hey, we could have a portal. We could have a portal in a week, but I just that goes back to if the target and the CIA can get hacked. I don't I don't trust that we won't get hacked too. So I just don't want the liability of any of that. We, we're an open book. You've got, you can get your lab results copied and handed to you right through the window here, or, or we can go through them over the phone. Sure. I am still old school on that. I'm kind of glad we don't have the portal because a lot of that, I mean, you know, it takes a while to learn how to interpret all those labs. So if you just, if that information is just out there for patients to look at, I would think there would be a lot of room for. Well, there is. We see, we see abnormals that are not really abnormal, you know? Um, a liver enzyme that's a, a tick high, but it was, but it's been a tick high, you know, 15 other times through the years. But if they see that and they read it, they're pretty sure they have hepatitis. That's just, but that's human nature. They, they read, that's the, the Google, uh, you know, the Google input on all this. Whereas we would completely blow that off because in 2016, they had a clean ultrasound and their liver enzymes were exactly the same. I guess that's really a pretty good place to stop. Is there anything else you want to throw out there? Not at all. I feel comfortable with our conversation, Jody. Okay, good. I do too. I've enjoyed sitting down and talking with you. We don't we don't actually do this very often. Nah, we're too we're too busy. We uh we talk in passing all the time. We're 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 located. I'm looking at my office right now down the hallway, what approximately twenty feet from here. <laughs> but we never have long talks because we're busy. We're we're working. Sure. And I, I've talked about that on the podcast before. It's nice having you over there. So if I do need something, you're right there. Well, you know as much as I do at this point. I don't have to Well, I mean I know that, but yeah, <laughs> you just need, you just need a little a little convincing every once in a while. That's it. a little reassurance. But you know your stuff, man. I appreciate that. But uh, I'm not a fan of independent practice for practitioners. Like I couldn't have like I feel comfortable doing it now, probably after I guess this is my sixth year. But uh, right out of school, especially. No way. Like, I, we need a doctor. That residency is you don't know what you don't know. That's what is always said. And that's the truth. You don't know what you don't know. And if I'm a if I'm a patient, I wouldn't want I wouldn't want someone cutting their teeth, getting their wings with me, because looking back, you don't realize it until once you get now, you look back at five years ago and you think, oh, shoot, you know, think of all the things that you that, you know, now and feel comfortable with that uh, you wouldn't have even known you didn't feel uncomfortable with them until you were presented with a uh, bad outcome. I mean, I still learn things all the time. You know, I hope everybody in medicine does because yeah. there's so, there's just so much. To me, there's just more than any one brain can absorb. That's a challenge. It's never A equals B or it's never a straight algorithm with anything, which I think a lot of the uh, practitioner training, from my experience, has been a big algorithm. You know, if this, then do that. If this, then do that. But it's way more nuanced than that. Yeah. And I think that's the thing coming from being a nurse, an RN, before you become a practitioner. Everything is that way. It's, you know, here's your, here's your guidelines. Here's your rules. You know, you can do this. If it's outside this, you have to call, whatever. And I think when you when you come up with that mentality, it is very hard to switch over to like, OK, I'm the person that has to think and make the decisions now with minimal guidance. And they, like you said, the gray zone that you and Anne Marie talk about, the gray zone is a big deal. It's where when clinical judgment comes into play and yeah. experience, you know, kind of crafts that. How do you like keeping up with new research and, and new things? And especially in this kind of situation where we don't have an institution, you know, guiding us and telling us what we're supposed to do. How do you how do you handle that? Ooh, it's tough. You know, when you try to read that the used to, we would get the, there was a, a couple of good magazines that would come out with clinical, clinical updates. Now, I, most of my reading outside of my CME, I, you know, I'll do my CME and do way more than I'm what I'm supposed to. Um, I'll try to do that. I get a lot of it from that, but mainly it's just reading up on, on specific patients. When you see that, you know, looking up things, when you see a, when you see an interesting patient or an interesting case, uh, you get your reading from that. I would say that's the bulk of what I do now because I just don't have time to read two hours a day, you know, or shoot 30 minutes a day. By the time I'm done with charting and in, in life, it's tough. Or I, I would say if you can find anything like the AAFP, the American Academy of Family Practice has good kind of what they call clinical pearls, where it's just bullet points of, of things. And then you can get more in, into the weeds based on those, but you get good updates from things like that. But uh, mainly it's just reading up on case cases. 
when I have a, a question or need to bone up on something from one of my own patients. And then you do that, you know, once a week or once every two weeks. And over the course of a year, you've got updates on all kinds of things. It adds up. Yeah, I've, I've maintained a subscription to the New England Journal, but I think I'm going to let it go because I just don't. I've, I've let that go. I just don't have hours to sit around and read through all that it stuff. Is, <laughs> and it's obscure. They, it, it goes back to two. when you know, like when I was family medicine training, I was delivering babies. I was, say, you know, doing neonatal care, doing um, uh, gynecolog- a lot of gynecological care. That, that none of that's applicable to what we do in here. You know, the New England Journal and some of those, some of those kind of big broad scope things. I mean, you're reading about, you know, obscure fungal infections in HIV patients. It's like, oh my goodness, what in the world? Or I will read about that if I if I if I see it, but I can't cloud my brain with that. You know, when I'm dealing with you know Hashimoto's thyroiditis in here, I'd, I'd rather read about that. What resources specifically do you use other than AFP? Up to date, which our our uh, malpractice provider provides us with free up to date, which we would pay for it anyway as a subscription, but I've got a subscription through that. So up to date the is the still the mothership of the medical literature, just consolidates everything and has good you know, of course everything has a million citations on it. And then the I get most of my medical education through the American Academy of Family Practice website, the journals on there. I find up to date's very useful for like in depth learning oh, about yeah. things. And I love Hippocrates for just figuring out like what to do right now. Pharmaceutical stuff, which I have clinical stuff, I don't, you know, I really, but doing it for a while, you don't really have to look up in the here and now. I, I don't look up on the fly very often at all. If I do, I'll just tell the patient, let me look this up right here in front of you and I'll do it right in front of them on the computer. But um, for, uh, you know, dosings and th- dosages and things like that, Hippocrates is what I use. Oh, yeah. I definitely look things up in front of patients all the time. And I think they appreciate that too. You're not just uh, spitfire and you're, you're looking it up right in front of them. I try not to tell them, though. I try to just act like I'm writing their note, but really I'm looking up what I'm about to say. <laughs> well, that's fine, too. That's fine, too. If the freaking Internet's slow, I'm like, OK, I have to tell them that I'm looking yeah, this up, I guess. Right. But uh, otherwise, just writing a note over here. No. Yep. Yep. I guess you could do that. My uh, the way our uh, the my offices or my two exam rooms are configured as they can see that and a lot of times, I, I, which I read out what I'm typing. Uh, I mean, I do that all the time. I think you've seen me do that. My plans. So they sometimes just look at their chart as I'm writing it. So I can't do that. I think that's a little strategery, too, because if you're talking, they're not talking. Uh, yeah, it could be. I haven't thought of it that way, but it could be. <laughs> oh, that, I, that's what I thought when I saw you do it. Like, oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Mine is because I and I, I found this out a, a lot of times. It, it, it is it really uh, turns your notes accurate. But I'll, I'll sit there. They came in with a great to- or right big toe um, issue. And I'm writing it out and I say, and then on the, you know, this is a paranychia on the left great toe. And then they say, right, right there as I'm writing it and, uh, uh, and correct you right on the fly. It's nice. Or if I say, you know, for the last two weeks, he has had this. And he says, no, no, no I said 10 days. It helps me with accuracy. OK, yeah, that's a great point. That helps me. I, I read it out. But also it goes back to that. We go through a lot of stuff. And if I, especially at the annual exam, if I'm saying they're due for colonoscopy later this year, that we need to get their mammogram ordered in there. Uh, bone density. It's been five years and all this. If I write that out, if, if I read it out as I'm writing it, then that's the second time they're hearing it because I, I go through my checklist with them and then I write it out in, in regards to my plan. So it may it may hammer at home the things too that, that they need to do. That's a good point. I've read studies before where it's like, oh yeah, patients only ever actually retain like 10% of what you say. I'm not a um, an auditory learner at all. I'm a, I'm a visual learner. I had to read like back in medical school. You know, I can't uh, lectures. I would be wasting an hour versus just reading the transcript. So a lot of patients are the same way, I'm sure. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I always wonder or or sometimes you see when they come back, like you realize what they didn't get because they're not taking their medicine right or whatever. Agreed. Maybe that would be an advantage of having a, a portal kind of situation. It could. But it, but then again, it, with the portal, they're not looking at their office notes. You know, they'd just be looking at labs and basic things, I would think. I don't think they would look at their full office notes. Surely not. Dr. Brian James, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. Anytime, Jody. Anytime. We'll do it again. Okay. What do you want to talk about next time? No idea. I'll let you you dictate that. All right. Very good. Another big thank you to my guest today, Dr. Brian James. One other thing that struck me as I was going through editing and listening back to the interview that you may not think of as part of the art of medicine, but it is a big part of working in medicine, and that is that sometimes it's really about who you know. Dr. James and I actually grew up together. I have a picture in my hallway at our office of the Little League team that we were both on together when we were like 12. 
the all-star team, I should point out. We went to school together for, I guess, two years at that time. And then I changed school systems and we were never really the closest of friends. But then it worked out that we came back together after college and ended up living together for almost three years while he was in medical school. And then fast forward another handful of years. And like he said in the interview, I just sort of fell into this position. I happened to finish my practitioner training around the time that he happened to be looking for a practitioner and it all just worked out. And looking back on all that, he was never someone in my life that I would have pegged as having a big influence on the course my life would take. But as it turns out, other than my husband and my parents, of course, knowing him has turned out to be one of the most important factors that's influenced the course of my career and my life. So there are a couple lessons to be learned there. Networking really is helpful. Don't burn any bridges and be nice to everyone because you never know who's going to end up helping you out down the road. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for episode topics, feel free to email me anytime. It's the kppod at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-K-P-P-O-D at gmail.com. All right, that does it for this episode of Knowledgeable Provider. I'm your host, Jody Marks. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to like, subscribe, or follow on your preferred listening platform. Give us a nice five-star rating and leave a nice review. If you'd like to help support the show, you can do that at patreon.com slash knowledgeable provider. And as always, stay safe, take care of yourself, and take care of your patients in that order.